Music, uh, hanging out with uh, my good friend and who I like to call the mayor of East Nashville, Mr. <laughs> Guthrie Trapp. I'm just not arguing with any of this anymore. And I will say this, no one else has argued when I, I've, I've been referring to you around town as the mayor of East Nashville and no one's argued with that. No one has said that's not true. So well, now that I have you here, I thought it'd be really cool um, for you to just talk about a basic approach because you see so many people just get lost in a scale shape. I try to um, kind of look at all this, zoom out, look at music from an eagle eye view of what is the goal that we're all going for. And the goal is to be able to communicate via this language of music. And so to me, I do see a lot of guys kind of struggling with playing over a dominant seven chord versus a major and minor because you're combining the two of those, you know, we could get into the theory of that, basic theory of that, but it's, it's really having some uh, intent when you sit down and pick up your instrument. You're either playing by yourself with no other, you know, influences as far as being accountable for a metronome or playing with another person or a record or a live band situation. So thinking about this, if you're gonna play, it's great to play if you can with an ensemble. When you sit down by yourself, you know, try to have, like the first thing I'll do if I pick up my guitar is I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna play a chord. It could, you know, just, it could be an E major chord, it could be a B minor chord, it could be an A dominant seven chord. But I'm getting that foundation tonality of where I wanna go, or letting that determine where I wanna go when I sit down. And so there's an intent to kinda hold yourself accountable, and it's a combination of the core basic fundamentals of knowing the fingerboard, but also this is ear training, and kind of making yourself stay and not waver in and out of minor and major and dominant seven because I see this a lot. And so it's sitting down and playing a foundation that you can then improvise off of or work something out over with the intent of not wavering into these other sounds and scales that, that don't make sense, you know? It's great for your ear too. You're kind of responsible for three sounds, major, minor, dominant seven, and then I'll lump major seven in with major, it's a subcategory because the same scale is used. But when you play minor, you can play minor pentatonic and it works. When you play major, you can play major pentatonic for the most part and that works. When you play over a dominant seven chord, you're now getting the major, you're getting the root note A, you're getting the major third, and then you're getting the flat seven, G. So it's this tritone. You can play your one, four, five just by moving this. And this is an interesting thing. When you play this tritone, that's the major third and the flat seven of A. When you move it back a half step, now you're playing D seven. The, the G string now becomes the flat seven of D. The D string becomes the major third of D. And you're just using the same shape. And then when you move it up to E, it's the same relationship as the D. Now the G string becomes the flat seven of E, and the D string becomes the major third of E. So there's a relationship between that tritone moving half steps that covers the one, the four, the five, the four, and then one. So when you're playing lead guitar, this is the chords are directly related to playing lead guitar and anything you want to be able to do on the guitar. So the sooner you can start dissecting these triads and seeing how these lines are connected to resolving from the major third and flat seven to this major third and flat seven and then that one back. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but to get into that is really what starts separating the men from the boys as far as playing over a dominant seven chord because you can't 
If you play a minor pentatonic over this chord, you're not getting enough major third. If you play a major pentatonic over this chord, you're not getting enough of the blues. So you have to combine them together. Awesome. And that's where, I don't like to talk about modes, but that's right. where the Mixolydian mode, I call it the dominant seven scale, which is the major scale with the flat seven because it directly outlines that chord. And so the chord's the foundation, the arpeggio is the first level of framework, the scale is the second level of framework, and then if you're playing a major or a minor, the pentatonic is mixed in there as well. But it gets a little tricky playing over that dominant seven chord. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and you gotta you kinda really ride the fence between the blues sound and the major sound over that chord. All right, well I'll play that A7 for you. So one thing that, that cool that you can do to, to kind of wrangle this in a little bit is you can play the same line over all three chords until you start getting this sound under your belt. So if I play A7, and I break that down into this part of the chord, and there's my A7, I can play. That's like the line, right? Because you're adding that boogie woogie thing, you know, we all do adding that flat seven, which immediately takes your ear to that chord. So if I'm playing this, now I can play. Now that's a combination of the flat seven. I'm going down the scale a little bit right there. And sliding up to the major third and capping off the punctuation with the root note. If I'm playing over the four chord, Five chord, four, so there's a little bit of a line going on there that's more musical than just playing the scale or the arpeggio. And so, and also when I say target the notes in the chord, you can't just play the target notes. There has to be some connectivity there that makes a complete thought. It's very much like a language. It is Absolutely. a language. So, so you went, you know, something like, you know, outlining right. that, and then the four you went up here, right? You were doing it already, but um, finding, you know, first you just can outline that main chord shape, right? Play the same one, right? But eventually you can find those melodies in one spot, and you can do it at any spot of the neck, but right, right, totally, yeah. I'd say if you're gonna learn one of those lines, try to learn it in every chord shape up the neck, you know, and it, but it has to make sense. If you're trying to work out a line, your hand should never be moving more than than this right here. If you're jumping up to try to find something, chances are you need to move up and find it in a more economical spot. So if I'm playing out of this, that's why the cage system is so important because you're you're literally outlining, you're playing your one, four, five in each of these uh, positions. So I can play over all those chords in each position and you want to learn them, you know, vertically and then start connecting them horizontally. And that's when stuff really starts to open up. If you can't visualize these major chord shapes and them, those triads, you're always gonna be lost on the guitar. All right, thank you Guthrie Trap for hanging out again, man, and, and showing some awesome concepts. Uh, you guys, please follow, if you don't already, I, I, I assume a lot of you do, but if you don't already, follow Guthrie Trap um, on his YouTube channel and his social media. We've got links below. He's also got a, a whole site of lesson stuff. 
uh, with artist work. So, um, you know, go out there and support him and, and check out those links below. And uh, we'll, we'll end with a little jam. Let's Thanks so it. much, Marty. Always a pleasure, man. My pleasure, man. Appreciate Thank you guys. You.